Okay, calm down. The show Star Wars Rebels wrapped up a few months ago after four seasons. I wasn't going to review it, but after the announcement of the new season for Star Wars The Clone Wars, many of you have asked me to give my thoughts on its sequel series. I started this channel reviewing animated TV shows and actually gave my thoughts on the six seasons of The Clone Wars that have come out so far. So in this video, I'm going to break the series down from the story to the characters, as well as discuss many of the Easter eggs that the show has. Now, there will be some spoilers in the video, but I'll warn you before I spoil anything big. Just look out for this sign at the top right corner. So let's get started. This is how a rebellion starts. Small, with a few people standing together. The show is split up into four seasons and takes place in between episode three and episode four. It's roughly 14 years after Revenge of the Sith and five years before A New Hope. The show is basically an origin story for the Rebel Alliance, who are the main protagonists in the original three films. We watch them gather together and get stronger and stronger as the series progresses. We specifically follow the journey of one Rebel Squadron that consists of five heroes and one droid. As I said, this is the sequel series to the very particular successful Star Wars The Clone Wars show on Cartoon Network. The show was cancelled when Disney bought Lucasfilm. This is obviously because Disney didn't want one of their biggest rivals to have the rights to something that they now own. So they made their own show on Disney XD with the same man behind the project, Dave Filoni. The two shows have a lot in common, but the way that they're structured is very different. The Clone Wars was much more serial based, much like Flash Gordon, a big influence of the original Star Wars films. Just like Flash Gordon, you didn't need to see the previous episode to understand what was going on. The Clone Wars had arcs that lasted two to three episodes that were condensed into one story. The episodes for the Clone Wars weren't even released in the right order. Season 2, episode 16 is actually what took place first. Rebels is structured very differently. You need to watch it in order to understand what's going on. It's one constant story rather than many subplots scattered throughout. With the exception of Ahsoka, most of the characters in the Clone Wars were all people that we knew from the prequel films, but Rebels had all new characters that we had never met before. This of course meant that they had to flesh them out and give them backstories. This complicates the writing a great deal, especially compared to the writing that they had gotten so used to for the previous show. The team we follow consists of two Jedi, Ezra and Kanan, a Mandalorian with an attitude named Sabine, oh, a leader and pilot, Hera, I really a Lassat named Zeb, and a droid named Chopper. They take many archetypes that previous Star Wars properties have, with the Master and the Apprentice, the pilot, and one of the crew members who has a romance, and the droid used for comic relief. My favorite character by far is Kanan. The scene where he reveals himself as a Jedi for the first time was awesome. Pretty badass, actually. He, in my opinion, has the most interesting backstory, being an apprentice that escaped Order 66 after watching his master die. But at the same time, when I started watching the show, I had already read the Kanan comic series. So for me, he was the only one to have a super fleshed out backstory. So he had a bit of an advantage. The characters in Rebels are not as good as the characters from the Clone Wars, but that's expected because again, they're all new. None of their stories have been explored, while the Clone Wars characters had a whole three movies that fleshed these characters out, so we knew them well. That being said, the biggest problem that I have with the Rebels characters is that they don't explore them until seasons two and three. We get bits and pieces of their backstory, like the fact that Sabine was in the Imperial Academy, that Zeb is the last of his race, and that Ezra's parents are dead. But we don't even come close to getting their full backstories in season one. And this is a shame, because when they do study their backstories, they each have such rich detail, and we really feel for these characters. But that's not the case in season one, because we don't really know who they are. This makes it harder to get into the story. Now that's not to say that I don't root for them or don't care about them, because of course I do. I love their sort of family dynamic, and I love how loyal they are. But had the characters been fleshed out in season one, the season would have been a lot better. Season one was by far the weakest season of the series. It was aimed way too much at kids, which is not what the fans of the Clone Wars were used to or even wanted. There was far too much reliance on bringing in fan favorite characters, almost as if they didn't think that the show was good enough to carry itself on its own. The first scene of the very first episode doesn't even start with any of the main characters, but rather with Darth Vader speaking to an Inquisitor. It's a scene that could have very easily been placed after we met the main characters, but it does draw you in right away, and I really like the scene. But this is a sign that the creators thought that they needed a crutch. James Earl Jones returns to voice Vader, which is incredible. The Jedi Knights are all but destroyed, and yet your task is not complete, Inquisitor. And the voice actor for the Inquisitor is Jason Isaacs, who played Lucius Malfoy in Harry Potter. Nice Lucius Malfoy. 
he did an outstanding job as well. Also, the Inquisitor's lightsaber is awesome and nothing like we've ever seen before. Season 1 brings us many other character appearances, just Tarkin, Lando, C-3PO, and R2-D2, and even Obi-Wan, just to name a few. And it's one thing to have cameos, but these cameos turn out to be the best parts of the season, which is not a good sign if you want your audience to identify with your main characters. The main villain of the series is the Inquisitor. He's sent by Vader to eliminate the remaining Jedi after Order 66. This is interesting because this was taken straight from the video game The Force Unleashed, where Vader sent Star Killer to do the same job. When Disney bought Lucasfilm, however, this story was made not canon. But the voice actor for Starkiller did go on to play Darth Maul in both The Clone Wars and Rebels. The best parts of season one for me was watching Kanan train Ezra and seeing the relationship grow. Look, I just wanted you to have the best teacher. Well, I don't want the best teacher. I want you. One of my favorite episodes was called Path of the Jedi. This is where Ezra gets his kyber crystal to create his lightsaber, which is awesome, by the way. He made it both a gun and a saber. In the episode, we even get to hear Ezra talk to Master Yoda, who was voiced once again by Frank Oz, which was not the case in the Clone Wars series, so it's cool to have him back. Your path, you must decide. Many other cast members return to voice their characters as well, including Billy D. Williams for the voice of Lando, Anthony Daniels as C-3PO, and as I said before, James Earl Jones as Vader. Anthony Daniels is probably the most loyal Star Wars cast member. Every official appearance 3PO has made since 1977 has been voiced by Anthony Daniels. Some other notable episodes of Season 1 include Breaking Ranks, where Ezra goes undercover to train at the Imperial Academy to become a stormtrooper. It's cool to get an inside look on how they train them. This reminded me a bit of the Clone Wars episode where Boba goes undercover at the clone training facility. They even have the same hair. Dante Bosco, the voice of Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender, also lent his voice for this episode, which was really cool to hear. Now, as good as these episodes were, the season finale was the best episode in season one by far. We see Kanan and Ezra fight the Inquisitor in a fight very reminiscent of the final fight in The Phantom Menace with a similar location and a master and apprentice versus a weird looking dude that has a double bladed lightsaber. During the fight, Ezra gets cut on his face, which is actually permanent and is there for the rest of the series. I really liked this because it shows there are lasting consequences. At the end of the episode, we learn for the first time that there are many other rebel teams just like them. We're a cell? Wait, did you know we were a cell? Um, no. We also get the big face reveal of Fulcrum, their secret contact, and it turns out to be Ahsoka, who we hadn't seen since she left Anakin at the temple in the season 5 finale of The Clone Wars. So it was awesome to see her again. But I've got to point out that again, the finale's big reveal had nothing to do with the Rebels' plotline or characters, but all of its weight came from The Clone Wars. But of course, I'm not complaining. It was an incredible reveal, and I loved it so much. Season 2. This was a lot better than the last season. The beginning episodes alone proved that. Vader plays a big part in the first two episodes, and probably has more lines here than he does in Revenge of the Sith and Rogue One combined. We see our band of rebels face Vader for the first time, and Kanan and Ezra are vastly outmatched. We then see Vader tear through all of the rebel fleet with ease, which is reminiscent of a recent comic where Vader does the same thing, but in between episodes 4 and 5 I believe. But the best part was the end, when both Vader and Ahsoka sense each other. Lives. The very next episode, we see Rex, who was a big character in the Clone Wars. My name is Rex, Captain, 501st Clone Battalion. There's a cool dynamic where Kanan doesn't trust Rex or the other clones. I really like this because it explores how unprepared the Jedi were for their loyal soldiers to turn on them. Kanan lived through this, so it's interesting, and it makes sense that he would have PTSD and mistrust when he came face to face with these clones again. Our fellow soldiers, the clones, the ones we Jedi fought side by side with, suddenly turned and betrayed us. They were spot on by making the two characters' relationship tense, but slowly we watched them build trust in one another. It's also cool to see a clone and Jedi fight side by side again. Later on, we see Rex and Ahsoka's reunion, which was very touching for me and I'm sure many other Clone Wars fans.
Rex pretty much permanently joins the Rebel team, which is so cool, and it's a great bridge between the two shows. As I said, this season fleshes out the mysteries of the characters and their backstories. Toward the middle of the season, each character seemed to get their own episode. Ezra finally finds out the fate of his parents, which had been a mystery for a long time. He learns that they were captured, and they rallied and escaped, but were killed during the breakout. Ezra also finds out that they died proud of him, as they had heard that he was fighting with the Rebellion. We see Ezra break down crying, something we don't often see our hero do. It makes him so much more vulnerable, and makes us really relate to him. In Sabine's episode, we find out that she's part of House Vizsla of Mandalore, which we were introduced to in the Clone Wars, specifically to Prey Vizsla. We also learn that her mother is part of Death Watch, the terrorist group that tried to take over Mandalore toward the end of Season 5 of the Clone Wars. Her story isn't completely fleshed out here, though. We won't get there until the next season. For Hera's episode, we learn that her mother was killed, and that her father is Sham Sendula, who was the liberator of Ryloth alongside yep. Mace Windu during the- Outnumbered 100 to 1. We Correct. Right, we all know who you are. Let's, let's get this at rank. Let it help. Charged across Lesu's energy bridge to certain doom. I think it's awesome that they were able to incorporate that connection, because it once again bridges the two shows together perfectly. In Zeb's episode, we learned that he was the protector of the royal family, and when he woke up, everything and everyone was gone. Up until this point, we thought that Zeb was the last Lassat left, but here we find out that there's a whole other world, which houses huge numbers of Lassats. One of my favorite parts of Zeb's character is his relationship with Callus. He's been trying to catch the rebels since the start of the show. Callus was there when Zeb's home planet, Lassan, fell, and he gave the order to wipe them out with a very powerful weapon called Ion Disruptors. I was there when Lassan fell. I know why you fear those disruptors. I gave the order to use them. Callus had previously seen his entire crew killed by Lasats, so the two had a reason to hate each other. They went head to head many times, but in one of my favorite episodes of season two, they're both stranded on a winter planet and they have to work together to survive. What they did with this episode was so interesting. Both Callus and Zeb keep saying that their team would rescue them first. Zeb is picked up long before Callus is, and he's greeted with hugs and laughter. While Callus is barely greeted at all. Admiral Constantine. Agent Callus. We see Callus for the first time start to question the Empire, which plays a big role in the events later on. We get even more cameos in this season. We see Hondo, the pirate, who was introduced in the Clone Wars, who is hilarious as always. But one of my best friends was a Jedi. I'm pretty sure we were friends. We also see Leia, which I think they handled very well. She was helping the rebels, but making it look like she was trying to fight them. This way they wouldn't suspect her home world of aiding in the fight against the Empire. If the Empire could prove Alderaan provided ships to the rebels, we'd lose our seat in the Senate. One scene that was totally awesome in the season was when Ahsoka came out of nowhere. She has white lightsabers, which was touched upon in her novel. She took them from an Inquisitor known as the Sixth Brother. The sabers were red due to his kyber crystals being corrupted by the dark side. But when Ahsoka took control of them, she restored the darkness in the crystals, which resulted them in turning white. Another episode worth mentioning is Shrouds of Darkness. Hearing Ahsoka talk about Anakin was really intriguing. But what a surprise people was how kind he was. He cared deeply about his friends and looked out for them until the end. What she said is also so true to what we saw in the Clone Wars, especially about caring deeply and looking out for his friends. During the episode, Kanan, Ezra, and Ahsoka go to the Jedi Temple and each see something different. Ezra once again speaks to Yoda, but this time we actually see him. Ahsoka's vision is the best, though. We hear Matt Lanter's voice, who played Anakin in the Clone Wars, say, Where were you when I needed you? I made a choice. Do you know what I've become? Ahsoka, overwhelmed with emotion, gets confirmation that Vader is her old master and her old friend. Tears pour out of her eyes as she swings her lightsaber, desperate for it to go away. It gives me chills every time. Once again, the season finale is the episode that steals the show. It's one of, if not the best episodes in the entire series. Kanan, Ezra, and Ahsoka go to a Sith temple. Here we see Maul's return. He's just as Maul. crazy as he was. You know what? Let's just let's, let's cheer for him. Us in the Clone Wars, but this time he's desperate to take down the Sith. The Sith took everything from me once I had power. Now I have nothing. 
So much happens in this episode. One of the most shocking moments is when Maul blinds Kanan. It's something that I did not see coming, and it made my heart stop. This yet again shows that they take risks, and they show the lasting effects of big events. But the best part of the episode is when Vader shows up. Ahsoka and Vader then come face to face. Our long-awaited meeting has come at last. This is what fans have been waiting for since the end of Season 5 of The Clone Wars. The part that made my mouth drop was when Ahsoka strikes Vader's helmet and part of his face is showing. We then hear James Earl Jones' voice mixed with Matt Lanter's. Ahsoka. And if that wasn't enough, Ahsoka says that she won't leave him. Not this time. So much suspense builds as they face each other, and you wonder what he's going to say, hoping he'll forgive her. And then he says, Then you will die. The scene was so well done, and it leaves you on a huge cliffhanger. We see Vader escape, but not Ahsoka. The scene where Kanan and Ezra return back to base says so much without a word of dialogue. First, we see Hera's reaction to Kanan's blindness as she hugs him in a truly desperate and loving embrace. We then see Rex and Ezra make eye contact, and he knows that his oldest friend is gone. You can see the sorrow on Rex's face, and it's heartbreaking. This is a true testament to how good these writers are. This is probably the best part of both Rebels and Clone Wars, in my opinion. It changed the show forever. Nothing would ever be the same after it. Season 3 starts off with a much older Ezra, who's kicking ass. Is that really Ezra? Season 3 is the longest, and is in my opinion, the best season of the series. This is because the show finally came into its own. It no longer relies on the Clone Wars, with the exception of Maul. But that's just because it was pretty much the only way to finish his story. Ahsoka doesn't appear at all, Vader doesn't appear at all, and there are no more Inquisitors. It finally focuses on strictly the Rebels. The beginning of the season shows Kanan meeting Bendu, who who teaches him how to use the Force to see, even though he's blind. Much like Daredevil from Marvel, or Toph from Avatar. Bendu is Force-sensitive, but it's neither the good nor the bad. I love how the show explores the middle ground of the Force, with Bendu, white lightsabers, and so much more. It's really fascinating, and it makes the series add a lot to the Star Wars canon. This season really started to bridge itself with the new hope and the rebellion involved in the original films. We get some great scenes with Mon Mothma, who appeared in Return of the Jedi, and more recently, Rogue One. She was also in a deleted scene from Revenge of the Sith. She is such a strong presence. They really nailed her character here. We will not rest until we bring an end to the Empire. We're also introduced to Wedge, one of the main pilots in all three of the original films. We see his origin here, and we learn that he was saved from an Imperial training site by Sabine. They also had Saw Gerrera make an appearance. He was first introduced in the Clone Wars, and was later added to Rogue One. One thing that's weird though, is that he looks way younger than he's supposed to, based on his appearance in Rogue One. But this is due to Rogue One's many reshoots, which made him much older. So that's unfortunate that it didn't quite line up, but his appearance is still really awesome. He showed up later in Season 4 as well, and I love how him and Mon Mothma had different tactics, which made them go head-to-head -head many times. In Rogue One, which took place about a year after Rebels, Mothma of course needed Saul's help and sent Jin Erso to go retrieve him. But he's so paranoid about Mothma and the Rebellion that he thinks Jin was sent to kill him. Did you come here to kill me? Which makes perfect sense now that we've seen his and Mothma's backstory in Rebels. That's enough. What are you afraid of? Senator, the truth. I also really liked how they explored the lasting effects of losing his sister hat on him. This is all I have left of her. We of course saw this in the Clone Wars. Losing his sister is what drove him to be an extremist, and is what made him lose his morals. Breaking this character down, it shows how well they bridged the Clone Wars, Rebels, and Rogue One. And it honestly makes me wish that we could have seen more of him. Now, we have to talk about the villain of this season, Grand Admiral Thrawn. I will start my operations here. And pull the rebels apart piece by piece. They'll be the architects of their own destruction. I grew up reading the novels Heir to the Empire, otherwise known as the Thrawn Trilogy. These were of course made as part of the old canon, so they don't count when it comes to Rebels or the Disney canon. But they decided to take Thrawn from the novel and put him in the show, which just makes me so excited. Disney released their own novel about Thrawn, which erased a lot of the old canon, but also added a lot, like the fact that Thrawn met Anakin before he met Darth Vader, and he said that Anakin was a cunning and courageous warrior. I actually really like this addition, because it shows how the two 
had similar ideals, and both ended up serving the Emperor, much like how Anakin and Tarkin bonded in the Clone Wars. I've fallen into favor with the Chancellor. He shall support me. Oh, I happen to know the Chancellor quite well myself. They did a great job with the Thrawn and Rebels. I love how he has such a cool temper, but when he snaps, it's scary. I found one line from the season really interesting. In the episode, The Last Battle, they see who is more superior, clones and Jedi, or battle droids. After they fight, Ezra says, I know the Jedi were wiped out, the clones were decommissioned, and the droid army was just shut down. The Clone War ended, but why? If none of you won, who did? It's an interesting thought. There are so many layers of corruption in this galactic government, and it goes to show just how complex the story Lucas wrote in the prequels was. And the crazy thing is, is that Palpatine was pulling the strings of all of them, ensuring that he would come out on top to start his own empire. He killed off the Sith, Jedi, and droids, and destroyed all of the clones' minds to make them loyal to him, only to replace them with stormtroopers. It's a really fascinating look at how well done the prequels were, which not many people notice. Now, as much as the show celebrates those amazing prequel moments, it also makes fun of some of them, too. Sabine says, Stupid sand gets everywhere. This refers to the most repeated and made fun of line from the prequels. I don't like sand. It's coarse, rough, and irritating, and it gets everywhere. Absolutely amazing. Another big moment in the season was seeing the origin of the Dark Saber, which was introduced in the Clone Wars. This sword plays a huge part in the season. Sabine's full backstory has finally opened up. We learned that she created a weapon for the Empire that destroyed the Mandalorian armor, which up until that point was indestructible. When she returns home, her brother and mother aren't happy to see her. When you left, the other clans turned their backs on us. We lost everything! Sabine later defeats Saxon, the man in charge working with the Empire. And after he loses, he tries to get a cheap shot, but Sabine's mother shoots him. The scene actually bears a close resemblance to the scene where Krell is killed during the Clone Wars. Anyway, this then starts a civil war, and Sabine swears to find someone to lead with the Dark Saber. I'm not Mandalore's leader. But I'll find the person who is. She then decides to stay with her family to help in the fight. I'm done running away. In these past few episodes, we've seen Sabine grow so much and come so far, both as a human being and a That's warrior. So it's a shame. True. That's so true. Drink. And she's left out of the back half of the remaining season. As I said earlier, Darth Maul's arc is finally finished in the season. He finds out that Obi-Wan is on Tatooine. It ends where it began. I love that line, and it makes his story arc come full circle. Seeing Maul come face to face with an older Obi-Wan is awesome. The voice actor they got for Obi-Wan sounds exactly like Alec Guinness. Maul used your desire to do good, to deceive you. He didn't hold with your father's ideals, thought he should have stayed here and not gotten involved. Obi-Wan doesn't want to fight him at first, but as soon as Maul senses Luke, everything changes. Perhaps you are protecting something. He immediately takes out his lightsaber, ready to fight, to protect the only hope that the Rebellion has. He first does the classic Obi-Wan pose that we've seen him do so many times during the prequels. Then he goes to the classic Alec Guinness pose. And finally, he decides to go to Qui-Gon's pose. The fight is short, which is exactly how it should be. Maul dies knowing that the boy Obi-Wan is protecting will finish what he couldn't. He will avenge us. This is honestly the perfect send-off for Maul. The scene is perfect. One more detail about these episodes I feel I have to mention, because it's just so interesting to me, is when Rex says, No one would like to believe General Kenobi's alive more than I would. But Senator Organa confirmed his death. I think it's so cool that Senator Organa protected Obi-Wan like that, because we all know that he was involved in the hiding of the twins and Obi-Wan's final mission to protect Luke on Tatooine. A big focus that the season has is on Callus. After realizing that he didn't believe in what the Empire was doing anymore, seeds that were planted back in mid-season 2, he became the Rebellion's new fulcrum, giving them inside information on the Empire. I always love a good redemption story. Here we see just how smart he is when he takes all of these measures to frame another Imperial officer. I also love a scene where he's held prisoner on an elevator, but the next shot, his guards are knocked out and he's out of the cuffs. His arc actually reminds me a lot of Zuko's from Avatar. He starts out the series by hunting them down, then slowly starts to drift away from that life, and ultimately joins the heroes to help finish the mission. 
The final two episodes of the season were some of the most action-packed episodes in the whole series. Kalos is caught playing the role of Fulcrum by Thrawn. Kalos is then held captive as Thrawn attacks the rebel base. It's an all-out war in both space and on the ground. My favorite line by Hera is said here. If I go out, it's gonna be on the coast. That line pretty much sums up her whole character. When the rebel forces arrive, they're led by Jan Dudana and Commander Sato. Dudana was in Rogue One and was more famously in A New Hope, briefing the squadrons on the mission to destroy the Death Star. We've known Sato since season one of the series, and this is my favorite episode that he's in. To get Ezra through the blockade, Sato realizes that the only way to do this is to sacrifice himself. It's such a powerful moment, especially- Rest in peace, Sato. Actually, one of my favorite characters, actually. In the whole time, so. Rest in peace. Because Sato's been there since the beginning. At the end of the episode, the Thrawn comes face to face with Bendu, the force wielder that helped Kanan see. Here we see how truly badass Thrawn is, shooting Bendu right in the face. At the end of the episode, we get a nice scene where Kalos is rescued, and both he and Kanan thank each other. Thank you for taking me in. Thank you for risking everything. Before the episode ends, there's one more throwaway line. I was just a second hyperspace jump before heading to Yavin. Yavin is of course where the rebel base was in A New Hope, and where the destruction of the Death Star took place. A battle that's called the Battle of Yavin. It's awesome to see us getting closer and closer to the events of A New Hope. The next season was the fourth and final season of the series. This season starts out very strong, showing us the very end of the Civil War on Mandalore. There are some great battle scenes, and it's cool to see Sabine leading with the Dark Saber. We meet Sabine's dad during a rescue mission. You are my daughter. Later on, Lady bo makes an appearance. She was in the show's predecessor, and is Duchess Satine's sister. She had betrayed her Death Watch crew, and helped Obi-Wan during the Battle of Mandalore and the Clone Wars. bo was made regent by the Jedi before the end of the Clone War. She's still seen by many as Mandalore's rightful ruler. During the Civil War, we see a shot of Ezra entering the battle, which is a shot that is almost identical to the Clone Wars, where Obi-Wan enters the previous Battle of Mandalore. It's cool how they paid homage to that scene, especially because I think it's one of the best shots in the entire Clone Wars series. There's so many layers, and so much is going on. It must have been so hard to animate. Lady bo eventually accepts the Dark Saber in an awesome scene, where all of Mandalore bows down to the rightful leader. Thrawn returns as the main villain in the season, which I really like. You see so many shows today having a villain that only lasts that. one season, and you know that they're going to die by the time that the season ends. But here, he's not going anywhere, and I love it. He's back and badder than ever. Now that the Rebel base is on Yavin, the place where we know it will stay for at least another year really when the events of Episode 4 <laughs> take place, I started you know, wondering what they were going to do with these characters. I thought, are they going to kill them? Are they going to pull in Ahsoka? It really got me thinking. It made me really excited to watch the rest of the season because I wanted to know what they were going to do. One thing really cool that we find out in Season 4 is that the Death Star Super Laser is powered by a giant kyber crystal, the thing that powers a lightsaber. Another cool easter egg is when Tarkin says to Thrawn, Your TIE Defender program is at risk. Orson Krennic has been quite persuasive about diverting the funding to his own project, Stardust. This is a reference to Rogue One. Orson Krennic was one of the villains that oversaw the project Stardust, aka the creation of the Death Star. They actually almost put Orson bad. Krennic in this episode of Rebels, but Dave Filoni decided against it, saying he wasn't sure adding multiple Star Wars villains together would work. The gang eventually goes back to Lothal, the planet that their journey started on. It's funny. No matter what happens, we always end up back here on Lothal. On the planet, we're introduced to Loathe Wolves. They have a special connection with Kanan. They repeat the word Doom, which happens to be Kanan's real name, Caleb Doom. Kanan gets a lot of focus in this season, with both the Loathe Wolves and his relationship with Hera. They start to become more and more romantic. There are lines here and there throughout the season that hint to their romance until they finally kiss. Many people have been saying that it came out of nowhere, no, but I don't think that's true. They've always had a special connection that seemed to be more than friendship. They were like the parents of the team, working together like a couple. As early as season one, we see signs that they might be more than friends. You're welcome, dear. There's a scene where Kanan is terrified 
to meet Hera's father, as if he were her boyfriend or something. Some other examples of them being couple-ish is how Hera gets mad at him for leaving at the end of season 2. And of course, her reaction to his blindness. She caresses his face and then hugs him tightly in a loving embrace. I think the main reason why their romance never really blossomed until now is because the fight for freedom always got in their way. But now, I think that both of them could feel that the end of the war is near. Kanan especially could feel that there is a new hope for the rebellion. In the episode called Jedi Knight, Kanan comes into his own, knowing what his future holds. He cuts off his ponytail, shaves his beard, and leaves his eye cover behind. Kanan and Hera finally say that they love each other and have their big kiss. At the end of the episode, Kanan saves the other, sacrificing his own life. Now, I knew this was coming yeah, based on how the episode was going up until this point. I literally wrote in my notes that I was taking for this video. Seems like Kanan's gonna die. It was obvious, but all the same, when it happened, my heart sank. Seeing the team's reactions is one of the saddest parts, especially when they return to Zeb. Sabine? What's wrong? Sabine? Zeb comforts Ezra, and Chopper comforts Hera. The heartbreak that Hera must have felt is exponential. She finally told the man that she loved how she felt and lost him moments later. The two looking into each other's eyes right before he saves her must linger in her mind constantly. The writers did a phenomenal job with that whole sequence. Another episode worth mentioning is Wolves and Adore. This explores a mural of the Mortis gods, the father, the sister, and the brother. We of course saw these three in the Mortis trilogy of the Clone Wars, which were actually my favorite episodes of that series. The Emperor also makes an appearance, and Ian McDermott reprises his role, something he didn't do for the Clone Wars. He's the only one that can nail the character's intimidation and craziness. Ezra eventually ends up in the middle of all time and space, which in itself is awesome. We then start to hear voiceovers from the original trilogy, the prequel trilogy, the Clone Wars, Rebels, and the new movies as well. Those voices. Time to fight is now. Where are they coming from? It's really awesome to hear all of them combined. This is also where we finally get the answers to what happened to Ahsoka back in Season 2. Ezra literally pulls her out of time itself, which is an awesome concept. And based on concept art by Filoni, it seems like he had this in mind from the start. It's a good way to take Ahsoka out of the story to focus more on the Rebels. We also get some clarification on the bird that we know to be a convoy. It comes appearing in the final episodes of Season 2 and seems to have a connection been okay. with Ahsoka. I've seen a bird like that before. Whenever Ahsoka visited us on Adalon, it was always nearby. In this episode, we see the convoy on the shoulder of the sister in the mural. When Ahsoka sees it, she calls it by its name, Morai. Morai, you're here. Ahsoka then says, She's an old friend. I owe her my life. The sister sacrificed her life to save Ahsoka in the Mortis trilogy. So I took this to mean that the bird is the sister reincarnated. The series finale was an hour-long special. The remaining team members worked to it free Lothal, place where finale. it all began. One of my favorite it. parts of the episode was when Ezra knew he had to leave to face Thrawn. One last time. Sabine sees that he's about to leave, and the two have a wordless exchange where Sabine understands. She distracts the others so that he can go. It really shows the connection that the two have built over the last four seasons. They clearly have a mutual respect for I one really another. Hope we later JJ see Ezra Andrews face the Emperor, and Ezra is this. strong enough to not give in to his manipulation, which but I not really many can say. Happened. The ending of the series was very well done. Ezra brings Purgles to the fight, which win the battle, destroying all Imperial ships on Lothal. The few that are left jump into hyperspace with Thrawn and Ezra on board. Ezra gave up everything to free his home planet. Watching Ezra leave was another moment that made my heart sink, because I knew he wasn't coming back for a long time. Seeing everyone's silent reactions made that very clear. Ezra says his goodbyes over a pre-recorded hologram. I couldn't have wished for a better family. What they did next is honestly so cool to me. They skip ahead to after the Battle of Endor when the Emperor was defeated, which is of course right after the original trilogy ended. They wrap up many loose ends. They wrap up Kallus' arc by showing him that he didn't wipe out all of the Lasats as he thought that he did. Zeb took Kallus along the secret hyperspace path to the planet Lyrasan a world where he was welcome as one of them. I also love the fact that Rex and Hera fought in the Battle of Endor. Where they could have been hiding, I don't know, because the battle was in a pretty small area, but it's cool all the same. 
We also find out that Hera and Kanan had a son. I'm not sure when they could have had a chance to make him, but it's a nice wrap up for Hera, making sure that she wasn't alone after she lost the love of her life. And the best part in my opinion, Ahsoka and Sabine's new mission. Ezra's out there somewhere, and it's time to bring him home. I'm almost certain that Ezra's still alive, but as for Thrawn, I'm not so sure. There's a line from Bendu that leads me to believe that he's dead. I see your defeat, like many arms surrounding you in a cold embrace. He could be referring to the many arms, or I guess tentacles, of the Purgles. The final shot of the series gives me so many feels. They show a perfect mural of the team, surrounded by the creatures of Lothal, the planet that always called them back. Sabine and Ahsoka going on this new mission will most likely lead into Dave Filoni and his team's next project, called Star Wars Resistance. It takes place in between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens. There's a lot of time in between these two films, so there's a lot of story to tell. I'm excited for the new show coming in a few months. I'm not entirely sure what to expect, but hopefully it's on par with The Clone Wars and Rebels. Okay, Thanks so much no. for watching, guys. You can follow mm. me on social media. Links for that will be in the description. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my Patreons listed below. Good. If you want to be listed on my next Wait, video, hold on. plus a bunch of- I know. You want me to eat the drink, this, and finish this once and for all? Fuck you guys. Okay. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Empty. Happy. So thank you guys for watching this. Goodbye.